Section 11 The absence of Mademoiselle Swann, which, since it preserved me from the terrible risk of seeing her appear on one of the paths, and of being identified and scorned by this so privileged little girl, who had Bergot for a friend, and used to go with him to visit cathedrals, made the exploration of Tonsonville, now for the first time permitted me, a matter of indifference to myself, seemed, however, to invest the property, in my grandfather's and father's eyes, with a fresh and transient charm, and, like an entirely cloudless sky when one is going mountaineering, to make the day extraordinarily propitious for a walk in this direction. I should have liked to see their reckoning proved false, to see, by a miracle, Mademoiselle Swann appear, with her father, so close to us that we should not have time to escape, and should therefore be obliged to make her acquaintance. And so, when I suddenly noticed a straw basket lying forgotten on the grass, by the side of a line whose float was bobbing in the water, I made a great effort to keep my father and grandfather looking in another direction, away from this sign, that she might, after all, be in residence. Still, as Swan had told us that he ought not, really, to go away just then, as he had some people staying in the house, the line might equally belong to one of these guests. Not a footstep was to be heard on any of the paths. Somewhere in one of the tall trees, making a stage in its height, an invisible bird, desperately attempting to make the day seem shorter, was exploring with a long, continuous note the solitude that pressed it on every side. But it received at once so unanimous an answer, so powerful a repercussion of silence and of immobility, that, one would have said, it had arrested for all eternity the moment which it had been trying to make pass more quickly. The sunlight fell so implacably from a fixed sky that one was naturally inclined to slip away out of the reach of its attentions, and even the slumbering water, whose repose was perpetually being invaded by the insects that swarmed above its surface, while it dreamed, no doubt, of some imaginary maelstrom, intensified the uneasiness which the sight of that floating cork had wrought in me, by appearing to draw it at full speed across the silent reaches of a mirrored firmament. Now almost vertical, it seemed on the point of plunging down out of sight, and I had begun to ask myself whether, setting aside the longing and the terror that I had of making her acquaintance, it was not actually my duty to warn Mademoiselle Swann that the fish was biting, when I was obliged to run after my father and grandfather, who were calling me, and were surprised that I had not followed them along the little path, climbing uphill towards the open fields into which they had already turned. I found the whole path throbbing with the fragrance of hawthorn blossom. The hedge resembled a series of chapels, whose walls were no longer visible under the mountains of flowers that were heaped upon their altars, while underneath the sun cast a square of light upon the ground, as though it had shone in upon them through a window. The scent that swept out over me from them was as rich and as circumscribed in its range, as though I had been standing before the lady altar, and the flowers, themselves adorned also, held out each its little bunch of glittering stamens, with an air of inattention, fine, radiating nerves, in the flamboyant style of architecture, like those which, in church, frame the stair to the rude loft, or closed the perpendicular tracery of the windows, but here spread out into pools of fleshy white, like strawberry beds in spring. How simple and rustic, in comparison with these, would seem the dog-roses, which, in a few weeks' time, would be climbing the same hillside path in the heat of the sun, dressed in the smooth silk of their blushing pink bodices, which would be undone and scattered, by the first breath of wind. But it was in vain that I lingered before the hawthorns, to breathe in, to marshal before my mind, which knew not what to make of it, 
to lose in order to rediscover their invisible and unchanging odour, to absorb myself in the rhythm which disposed their flowers here and there with the light-heartedness of youth, and at intervals as unexpected as certain intervals of music. They offered me an indefinite continuation of the same charm, in an inexhaustible profusion, but without letting me delve into it any more deeply, like those melodies which one can play over a hundred times in succession without coming any nearer to their secret. I turned away from them for a moment, so as to be able to return to them with renewed strength. My eyes followed up the slope, which, outside the hedge, rose steeply to the fields, a poppy that had strayed and been lost by its fellows, or a few cornflowers that had fallen lazily behind, and decorated the ground here and there with their flowers like the border of a tapestry, in which may be seen at intervals hints of the rustic theme which appears triumphant in the panel itself. In frequent still, spaced apart as the scattered houses which warn us that we are approaching a village, they betokened to me the vast expanse of waving corn beneath the fleecy clouds, and the sight of a single poppy hoisting upon its slender rigging, and holding against the breeze its scarlet ensign, over the boy of rich black earth from which it sprang, made my heart beat as does a wayfarer's, when he perceives upon some low-lying ground an old and broken boat, which is being corked and made seaworthy and cries out, although he has not yet caught sight of it, THE SEA. And then I returned to my hawthorns, and stood before them, as one stands before those masterpieces of painting, which, one imagines, one will be better able to take in, when one has looked away for a moment, at something else. But in vain did I shake my fingers into a frame, so as to have nothing but the hawthorns before my eyes. The sentiment which they aroused in me remained obscure and vague, struggling and failing to free itself, to float across and become one with the flowers. They themselves offered me no enlightenment, and I could not call upon any other flowers to satisfy this mysterious longing. And then, inspiring me with that rapture which we feel on seeing a work by our favourite painter, quite different from any of those that we already know, or, better still, when someone has taken us and set us down in front of a picture of which we have hitherto seen no more than a pencilled sketch, or when a piece of music which we have heard played over on the piano bursts out again in our ears with all the splendour and fullness of an orchestra. My grandfather called me to him, and pointing to the hedge of Tonsonville said, You're fond of hawthorns. Just look at this pink one. Isn't it pretty? And it was indeed a hawthorn, but one whose flowers were pink and lovelier even than the white. It, too, was in holiday attire, for one of those days which are the only true holidays, the holy days of religion, because they are not appointed by any capricious accident, as secular holidays are appointed, upon days which are not specially ordained for such observances, which have nothing about them that is essentially festal. But it was attired even more richly than the rest, for the flowers which clung to its branches, one above another, so thickly as to leave no part of the tree undecorated, like the tassels wreathed about the crook of a rococo shepherdess, were every one of them in colour, and consequently of a superior quality by the aesthetic standards of Combray, to the plain, if one was to judge by the scale of prices at the stores in the square or at Camus, where the most expensive biscuits were those whose sugar was pink. And for my own part, I set a higher value on cream cheese when it was pink, when I had been allowed to tinge it with crushed strawberries. And these flowers had chosen precisely the colour of some edible and delicious thing, or of some exquisite addition to one's costume for a great festival, which colours, inasmuch as they make plain the reason for their superiority, are those whose beauty is most evident to the eyes of children, 
and for that reason must always seem more vivid and more natural than any other tints, even after the child's mind has realized that they offer no gratification to the appetite and have not been selected by the dressmaker. And, indeed, I had felt at once, as I had felt before the white blossom, but now still more marvelling, that it was in no artificial manner, by no device of human construction, that the festal intention of these flowers was revealed, but that it was nature herself who had spontaneously expressed it, with the simplicity of a woman from a village shop, labouring at the decoration of a street altar for some procession, by burying the bush in these little rosettes, almost too ravishing in colour, this rustic pompadour, high up on the branches, like so many of those tiny rose trees, their pots concealed in jackets of paper lace, whose slender stems rise in a forest from the altar on the greater festivals. A thousand buds were swelling and opening, paler in colour, but each disclosing as it burst, as at the bottom of a cup of pink marble, its blood-red stain, and suggesting even more strongly than the full-blown flowers the special, irresistible quality of the hawthorn tree, which, wherever it budded, wherever it was about to blossom, could bud and blossom in pink flowers alone, taking its place in the hedge but as different from the rest as a young girl in holiday attire, among a crowd of dowdy women in everyday clothes who are staying at home, equipped and ready for the month of Mary, of which it seemed already to form a part, it shone and smiled in its cool, rosy garments, a Catholic bush indeed, and altogether delightful. The hedge allowed us a glimpse inside the park, of an alley bordered with jasmine, pansies, and verbenas, among which the stocks held open their fresh, plump purses, of a pink as fragrant and as faded as old Spanish leather, while on the gravel path a long watering pipe, painted green, coiling across the ground, poured, where its holes were, over the flowers whose perfume those holes inhaled, a vertical and prismatic fan of infinitesimal rainbow-coloured drops. Suddenly I stood still, unable to move, as happens when something appears that requires not only our eyes to take it in, but involves a deeper kind of perception, and takes possession of the whole of our being. A little girl, with fair, reddish hair, who appeared to be returning from a walk, and held a trowel in her hand, was looking at us, raising towards us a face powdered with pinkish freckles. Her black eyes gleamed, and as I did not at that time know, and indeed have never since learned how to reduce to its objective elements any strong impression, since I had not, as they say, enough power of observation to isolate the sense of their colour, for a long time afterwards, whenever I thought of her, the memory of those bright eyes would at once present itself to me as a vivid azure, since her complexion was fair, so much so that, perhaps, if her eyes had not been quite so black, which was what struck one most forcibly on first meeting her, I should not have been, as I was, especially enamoured of their imagined blue. I gazed at her, at first, with that gaze which is not merely a messenger from the eyes, but in whose window all the senses assemble and lean out, petrified and anxious, that gaze which would fain reach, touch, capture, bear off in triumph the body at which it is aimed, and the soul with the body. Then, so frightened was I, lest at any moment my grandfather and father, catching sight of the girl, might tear me away from her by making me run on in front of them, with another, an unconsciously appealing look, whose object was to force her to pay attention to me, to see, to know me. She cast a glance forwards and sideways, so as to take stock of my grandfather and father, and doubtless the impression she formed of them was that we were all absurd people, for she turned away with an indifferent and contemptuous air, 
withdrew herself so as to spare her face the indignity of remaining within their field of vision, and while they, continuing to walk on without noticing her, had overtaken and passed me, she allowed her eyes to wander over the space that lay between us, in my direction, without any particular expression, without appearing to have seen me, but with an intensity, a half-hidden smile, which I was unable to interpret, according to the instruction I had received in the ways of good breeding, save as a mark of infinite disgust. And her hand, at the same time, sketched in the air an indelicate gesture, for which, when it was addressed in public to a person whom one did not know, the little dictionary of manners which I carried in my mind supplied only one meaning, namely, a deliberate insult. Gilbert, come along, what are you doing? Called out in a piercing tone of authority, a lady in white, whom I had not seen until that moment, while, a little way beyond her, a gentleman in a suit of linen ducks, whom I did not know either, stared at me with eyes which seemed to be starting from his head. The little girl's smile abruptly faded, and, seizing her trowel, she made off without turning to look again in my direction, with an air of obedience, inscrutable and sly. And so was wafted to my ears the name of Gilbert, bestowed on me like a talisman which might, perhaps, enable me some day to rediscover her whom its syllables had just endowed with a definite personality, whereas, a moment earlier, she had been only something vaguely seen. So it came to me, uttered across the heads of the stocks and jasmines, pungent and cool as the drops which fell from the green watering pipe, impregnating and irradiating the zone of pure air through which it had passed, which it set apart and isolated from all other air, with the mystery of the life of her, whom its syllables designated to the happy creatures that lived and walked and travelled in her company, unfolding through the arch of the pink hawthorn, which opened at the height of my shoulder, the quintessence of their familiarity, so exquisitely painful to myself, with her, and with all that unknown world of her existence, into which I should never penetrate. For a moment, while we moved away, and my grandfather murmured, Poor Swan, what a life they are leading him! Fancy sending him away, so that she can be left alone with her Charlou, for that was Charlou. I recognised him at once, and the child too, at her age to be mixed up in all that. The impression left on me by the despotic tone in which Gilbert's mother had spoken to her, without her replying, by exhibiting her to me as being obliged to yield obedience to someone else, as not being indeed superior to the whole world, calmed my suffering somewhat, revived some hope in me, and cooled the ardour of my love. But very soon that love surged up again in me, like a reaction by which my humiliated heart was endeavouring to rise to Gilbert's level, or to draw her down to its own. I loved her. I was sorry not to have had the time and the inspiration to insult her, to do her some injury, to force her to keep some memory of me. I knew her to be so beautiful that I should have liked to be able to retrace my steps so as to shake my fist at her and shout, I think you are hideous, grotesque, you are utterly disgusting. However, I walked away, carrying with me, then and for ever afterwards, as the first illustration of a type of happiness rendered inaccessible to a little boy of my kind, by certain laws of nature which it was impossible to transgress, the picture of a little girl with reddish hair, and a skin freckled with tiny pink marks, who held a trowel in her hand, and smiled as she directed towards me a long and subtle and inexpressive stare. And already the charm with which her name, like a cloud of incense, had filled that archway in the pink hawthorn through which she and I had, together, heard its sound, was beginning to conquer, 
to cover, to embalm, to beautify everything with which it had any association. Her grandparents, whom my own had been so unspeakably fortunate as to know, the glorious profession of a stockbroker, even the melancholy neighbourhood of the Champs-Élysées, where she lived in Paris. Leonie, said my grandfather on our return, I wish we had had you with us this afternoon. You would never have known Tonsonville. If I had had the courage, I would have cut you a branch of that pink hawthorn you used to like so much. And so my grandfather told her the story of our walk, either just to amuse her, or perhaps because there was still some hope that she might be stimulated to rise from her bed and to go out of doors. For in earlier days she had been very fond of Tonsonville, and moreover Swan's visits had been the last that she had continued to receive, at a time when she had already closed her doors to all the world. And just as, when he called, in these later days, to inquire for her, and she was still the only person in our household whom he would ask to see, she was sent down to say, that she was tired at the moment, and resting, but that she would be happy to see him another time. So, this evening, she said to my grandfather, Yes, some day when the weather is fine, I shall go for a drive as far as the gate of the park. And in saying this, she was quite sincere. She would have liked to see Swan and Tonsonville again, but the mere wish to do so, sufficed for all that remained of her strength, which its fulfilment would have more than exhausted. Sometimes a spell of fine weather made her a little more energetic. She would rise and put on her clothes, but before she had reached the outer room she would be tired again, and would insist on returning to her bed. The process which had begun in her, and in her a little earlier only than it must come to all of us, was the great and general renunciation which old age makes in preparation for death, the chrysalis stage of life, which may be observed wherever life has been unduly prolonged. Even in old lovers, who have lived for one another with the utmost intensity of passion, and in old friends bound by the closest ties of mental sympathy, who, after a certain year, cease to make the necessary journey, or even to cross the street to see one another, cease to correspond, and know well that they will communicate no more in this world. My aunt must have been perfectly well aware that she would not see Swan again, that she would never leave her own house any more, but this ultimate seclusion seemed to be accepted by her with all the more readiness for the very reason which, to our minds, ought to have made it more unbearable, namely, that such a seclusion was forced upon her by the gradual and steady diminution in her strength, which she was able to measure daily, which, by making every action, every movement, tiring to her, if not actually painful, gave to inaction, isolation, and silence, the blessed, strengthening and refreshing charm of repose. My aunt did not go to see the pink hawthorn in the hedge, but at all hours of the day I would ask the rest of my family whether she was not going to go, whether she used not, at one time, to go often to Tonsonville, trying to make them speak of Mademoiselle Swann's parents and grandparents, who appeared to me to be as great and glorious as gods. The name, which had for me become almost mythological, of Swan. When I talked with my family, I would grow sick with longing to hear them utter it. I dared not pronounce it myself, but I would draw them into the discussion of matters which led naturally to Gilberte and her family, in which she was involved in speaking of which I would feel myself not too remotely banished from her company, and I would suddenly force my father, by pretending, for instance, to believe that my grandfather's business had been in our family before his day, 
or that the hedge with the pink hawthorn which my Aunt Leonie wished to visit was on common ground, to correct my statements, to say, as though in opposition to me, and of his own accord, No, no, the business belonged to Swan's father. That hedge is part of Swan's park. And then I would be obliged to pause for breath. So stifling was the pressure upon that part of me where it was for ever inscribed, of that name which, at the moment when I heard it, seemed to me fuller, more portentous than any other name, because it was burdened with the weight of all the occasions on which I had secretly uttered it in my mind. It caused me a pleasure which I was ashamed to have dared to demand from my parents, for so great was it that to have procured it for me must have involved them in an immensity of effort, and with no recompense, since for them there was no pleasure in the sound and so I would prudently turn the conversation, and by a scruple of conscience also. All the singular seductions which I had stored up in the sound of that word swan, I found again as soon as it was uttered. And then it occurred to me suddenly that my parents could not fail to experience the same emotions, that they must find themselves sharing my point of view, that they perceived in their turn, that they condoned, that they even embraced my visionary longings, and I was as wretched as though I had ravished and corrupted the innocence of their hearts. That year, my family fixed the day of their return to Paris rather earlier than usual. On the morning of our departure, I had had my hair curled, to be ready to face the photographer, had had a new hat carefully set upon my head, and had been buttoned into a velvet jacket. A little later, my mother, after searching everywhere for me, found me standing in tears on that steep little hillside close to Tonsonville, bidding a long farewell to my hawthorns, clasping their sharp branches to my bosom, and, like a princess in a tragedy, oppressed by the weight of all her senseless jewellery, with no gratitude towards the officious hand which had, in curling those ringlets, been at pains to collect all my hair upon my forehead, trampling underfoot the curl papers which I had torn from my head, and my new hat with them. My mother was not at all moved by my tears, but she could not suppress a cry at the sight of my battered headgear and my ruined jacket. I did not, however, hear her. Oh, my poor little Hawthorns, I was assuring them through my sobs, it is not you that want to make me unhappy, to force me to leave you. You, you have never done me any harm, so I shall always love you. And, drying my eyes, I promised them that, when I grew up, I would never copy the foolish example of other men, but that even in Paris, on fine spring days, Instead of paying calls and listening to silly talk, I would make excursions into the country to see the first hawthorn trees in bloom. Once in the fields, we never left them again during the rest of our Mesoglise walk. They were perpetually crossed, as though by invisible streams of traffic, by the wind, which was to me the tutelary genius of Cambrai. Every year, on the day of our arrival, in order to feel that I really was at Combray, I would climb the hill to find it running again through my clothing and setting me running in its wake. One always had the wind for companion when one went the Mesoglise way, on that swelling plain which stretched mile beyond mile, without any disturbance of its gentle contour. I knew that Mademoiselle Swann used often to go and spend a few days at Léon, and for all that it was many miles away, the distance was obviated by the absence of any intervening obstacle. When, on hot afternoons, I would see a breath of wind emerge from the farthest horizon, bowing the heads of the corn in distant fields, pouring like a flood over all that vast expanse, and finally settling down, warm and rustling, among the clover, and San Juan at my feet, that plain which was common to us both seemed then to draw us together, to unite us. I would imagine that the same breath had passed by her also, 
that there was some message from her in what it was whispering to me, without my being able to understand it, and I would catch and kiss it as it passed. On my left was a village called Champieux, Campus Pagani, according to the curé. On my right I could see across the cornfields the two crocketed, rustic spires of saint andre des champs themselves as tapering, scaly, plated, honeycombed, yellowed, and roughened as two ears of wheat. At regular intervals, among the inimitable ornamentation of their leaves, which can be mistaken for those of no other fruit tree, the apple trees were exposing the broad petals of white satin, or hanging in shy bunches their unopened, blushing buds. It was while going the Mesicles way that I first noticed the circular shadow which apple trees cast upon the sunlit ground, and also those impalpable threads of golden silk which the setting sun weaves slantingly downwards from beneath their leaves, and which I would see my father slash through with his stick without ever making them swerve from their straight path. Sometimes, in the afternoon sky, a white moon would creep up like a little cloud, furtive, without display, suggesting an actress who does not have to come on for a while, and so goes in front in her ordinary clothes to watch the rest of the company for a moment, but keeps in the background, not wishing to attract attention to herself. I was glad to find her image reproduced in books and paintings, though these works of art were very different, at least in my earlier years, before Bloch had attuned my eyes and mind to more subtle harmonies, from those in which the moon seems fair to me to-day, but in which I should not have recognised her then. It might be, for instance, some novel by Santine, some landscape by Glare, in which she is cut out sharply against the sky, in the form of a silver sickle, some work as unsophisticated and as incomplete as were, at that date, my own impressions, and which it enraged my grandmother's sisters to see me admire. They held that one ought to set before children, and that children showed their own innate good taste in admiring, only such books and pictures as they would continue to admire, when their minds were developed and mature. No doubt they regarded aesthetic values as material objects which an unclouded vision could not fail to discern, without needing to have their equivalent in experience of life stored up and slowly ripening in one's heart. It was along the Mesocles way, at Montjuvin, a house built on the edge of a large pond, and overlooked by a steep, shrub-grown hill, that Monsieur Van Toy lived. And so we used often to meet his daughter driving her dog-cart at full speed along the road. After a certain year, we never saw her alone, but always accompanied by a friend, a girl older than herself, with an evil reputation in the neighbourhood, who in the end installed herself permanently one day at Montjuvin. People said, That poor Monsieur Van Toy must be blinded by love not to see what every one is talking about, and to let his daughter, a man who is horrified if you use a word in the wrong sense, bring a woman like that to live under his roof. He says that she is a most superior woman, with a heart of gold, and that she would have shown extraordinary musical talent if she had only been trained. He may be sure it is not music that she is teaching his daughter. But Monsieur Vinteuil assured them that it was. And indeed, it is remarkable that people never fail to arouse admiration of their moral qualities in the relatives of any one with whom they are in physical intercourse. Bodily passion, which has been so unjustly decried, compels its victims to display every vestige that is in them of unselfishness and generosity, and so effectively that they shine resplendent in the eyes of all beholders. Dr. Perspier, whose loud voice and bushy eyebrows enabled him to play to his heart's content the part of double-dealer, 
a part to which he was not otherwise adapted, without in the least degree compromising his unassailable and quite unmerited reputation of being a kind-hearted old curmudgeon, could make the curé and every one else laugh until they cried, by saying in a harsh voice, "'What do you say to this now? It seems that she plays music with her friend, Mademoiselle Van Toy. That surprises you, does it? Oh, I know nothing, nothing at all. It was Papa Van Toy who told me all about it yesterday. After all, she has every right to be fond of music, that girl. I should never dream of thwarting the artistic vocation of a child, nor Van Toy either, it seems. And then he plays music, too, with his daughter's friend. Why, gracious heavens, it must be a regular musical box, that house up there. What are you laughing at? I say they've been playing too much music, those people. I met Papa Van Toy the other day, by the cemetery. It was all he could do to keep on his feet. Anyone who, like ourselves, had seen Monsieur Van Toy about this time, avoiding people whom he knew, and turning away as soon as he caught sight of them, changed in a few months into an old man, engulfed in a sea of sorrows, incapable of any effort not directly aimed at promoting his daughter's happiness, spending whole days beside his wife's grave, could hardly have failed to realise that he was gradually dying of a broken heart, could hardly have supposed that he paid no attention to the rumours which were going about. He knew, perhaps he even believed, what his neighbours were saying. There is probably no one, however rigid his virtue, who is not liable to find himself, by the complexity of circumstances, living at close quarters with the very vice which he himself has been most outspoken in condemning, without at first recognising it beneath the disguise which it assumes on entering his presence so as to wound him, and to make him suffer. The odd words, the unaccountable attitude one evening, of a person whom he has a thousand reasons for loving. But for a man of M. Van Toy's sensibility, it must have been far more painful than for a hardened man of the world to have to resign himself to one of those situations which are wrongly supposed to occur in bohemian circles only, for they are produced whenever there needs to establish itself in the security necessary to its development, a vice which nature herself has planted in the soul of a child, perhaps by no more than blending the virtues of its father and mother, as she might blend the colours of their eyes. And yet, however much M. Van Toy may have known of his daughter's conduct, it did not follow that his adoration of her grew any less. The facts of life do not penetrate to the sphere in which our beliefs are cherished. As it was not they that engendered those beliefs, so they are powerless to destroy them. They can aim at them continual blows of contradiction and disproof without weakening them. And an avalanche of miseries and maladies coming one after another without interruption into the bosom of a family, will not make it lose faith in either the clemency of its God or the capacity of its physician. But when M. Van Toy regarded his daughter and himself from the point of view of the world and of their reputation, when he attempted to place himself by her side in the rank which they occupied in the general estimation of their neighbours, then he was bound to give judgment, to utter his own and her social condemnation in precisely the terms which the inhabitant of Combray most hostile to him and his daughter would have employed. He saw himself and her in low, in the very lowest water, inextricably stranded, and his manners had of late been tinged with that humility that respect for persons who ranked above him, and to whom he must now look up, however far beneath him they might hitherto have been. Their tendency to search for some means of rising again to their level, which is an almost mechanical result of any human misfortune. 
One day, when we were walking with Swann in one of the streets of Cambrai, Monsieur Vinteuil, turning out of another street, found himself so suddenly face to face with us all that he had not time to escape, and Swann, with that almost arrogant charity of a man of the world who, amid the dissolution of all his own moral prejudices, finds in another's shame merely a reason for treating him with a friendly benevolence, the outward signs of which serve to enhance and gratify the self-esteem of the bestower, because he feels that they are all the more precious to him upon whom they are bestowed, conversed at great length with M. Vinteuil, with whom for a long time he had been barely on speaking terms, and invited him, before leaving us, to send his daughter over one day to play at Tonsonville. It was an invitation which, two years earlier, would have enraged M. Vinteuil, but which now filled him with so much gratitude that he felt himself obliged to refrain from the indiscretion of accepting. Swann's friendly regard for his daughter seemed to him to be in itself so honourable, so precious a support for his cause, that he felt it would perhaps be better to make no use of it, so as to have the wholly platonic satisfaction of keeping it in reserve. "'What a charming man!' he said to us, after Swann had gone, with the same enthusiasm and veneration which made clever and pretty women of the middle classes fall victims to the physical and intellectual charms of a duchess, even though she be ugly and a fool. "'What a charming man! What a pity that he should have made such a deplorable marriage!' And then, so strong an element of hypocrisy is there, in even the most sincere of men, who cast off while they are talking to any one the opinion they actually hold of him, and will express when he is no longer there. My family joined with M. Vinteuil in deploring Swann's marriage, invoking principles and conventions which, all the more because they invoke them in common with him, as though we were all thorough good fellows of the same sort, they appeared to suggest were in no way infringed at Montjuvin. M. Vinteuil did not send his daughter to visit Swann, an omission which Swann was the first to regret, for constantly, after meeting M. Vinteuil, he would remember that he had been meaning for a long time to ask him about someone of the same name as himself, one of his relatives, Swann supposed. And on this occasion, he determined that he would not forget what he had to say to him, when M. Vinteuil should appear with his daughter at Tonsonville. Since the Maisiglis way was the shorter of the two that we used to take for our walks round Cambrai, and for that reason was reserved for days of uncertain weather, it followed that the climate of Maisiglis showed an unduly high rainfall, and we would never lose sight of the fringe of Roussenville wood, so that we could, at any moment, run for shelter beneath its dense thatch of leaves. Often the sun would disappear behind a cloud, which impinged on its roundness, but whose edge the sun gilded in return. The brightness, though not the light of day, would then be shut off from a landscape in which all life appeared to be suspended, while the little village of Roussenville carved in relief upon the sky the white mass of its gables, with a startling precision of detail. A gust of wind blew from its perch a rook, which floated away and settled in the distance, while beneath a paling sky the woods on the horizon assumed a deeper tone of blue, as though they were painted in one of those cameos which you still find decorating the walls of old houses. But on other days would begin to fall the rain, of which we had had due warning, from the little barometer figure which the spectacle-maker hung out in his doorway. Its drops, like migrating birds which fly off in a body at a given moment, would come down out of the sky in close marching order. They would never drift apart, would make no movement at random in their rapid course, but each one, keeping in its place, would draw after it the drop which was following, and the sky would be as greatly darkened as by the swallows flying south 
we would take refuge among the trees, and when it seemed that their flight was accomplished, a few last drops, feebler and slower than the rest, would still come down. But we would emerge from our shelter, for the rain was playing a game now among the branches, and, even when it was almost dry again underfoot, a stray drop or two, lingering in the hollow of a leaf, would run down and hang glistening from the point of it, until suddenly they splashed plump upon our upturned faces from the whole height of the tree. Often, too, we would hurry for shelter, tumbling in among all its stony saints and patriarchs, into the porch of saint andre des champs How typically French that church was! Over its door the saints, the kings of chivalry with lilies in their hands, the wedding scenes and funerals were carved as they might have been in the mind of Francoise. The sculptor had also recorded certain anecdotes of Aristotle and Virgil, precisely as Francoise in her kitchen would break into speech about Saint Louis, as though she herself had known him, generally in order to depreciate by contrast with him, my grandparents, whom she considered less righteous. One could see that the ideas which the medieval artist and the medieval peasant, who had survived to cook for us in the nineteenth century, had of classical and of early Christian history, ideas whose inaccuracy was atoned for by their honest simplicity, were derived not from books, but from a tradition at once ancient and direct, unbroken, oral, degraded, unrecognisable, and alive. Another Combray person, whom I could discern also, potential and typified, in the Gothic sculptures of saint andre des champs was young Theodore, the assistant in Camus' shop. And indeed, Francoise herself was well aware that she had in him a countryman and contemporary. For when my aunt was too ill for Francoise to be able, unaided, to lift her in her bed, or to carry her to her chair, rather than let the kitchen-maid come upstairs and, perhaps, make an impression on my aunt, she would send out for Theodore. And this lad, who was regarded, and quite rightly in the town, as a bad character, was so abounding in that spirit which had served to decorate the porch of saint andre des champs and particularly in the feelings of respect due, in Francoise's eyes, to all poor invalids, and above all to her own poor mistress, that he had, when he bent down to raise my aunt's head from her pillow, the same air of pre-Raphaelite simplicity and zeal which the little angels in the bas-reliefs wear, who throng with tapers in their hands about the deathbed of Our Lady, as though those carved faces of stone, naked and grey like trees in winter, were, like them, asleep only, storing up life and waiting to flower again in countless plebeian faces, reverend and cunning as the face of Theodore, and glowing with the ruddy brilliance of ripe apples. End of section 11